Hello everyone, this is Mutual Knowledge. I'm Gautier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is Sam Davidova. She is uh, doing many things. She's a very active girl, and notably, she is the representative of the Free Republic of Liberland uh, to the country of Georgia. Hi Sam, nice to have you here. Hi Gautier, thank you so much for inviting me. So, how did you come in, in contact with the, the blockchain industry, with uh, this whole ecosystem? Uh, thank you so much for asking. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, so I, my uh, I myself am more uh, in the IT industry. However, blockchain is sort of my hobby or side thing. However, uh, what made me more into uh, diving into that was definitely my cooperation with Liberland since it's uh, the first metaverse country. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so this this came to a more practical approach. And uh, to me, it's much more about the idea of decentralization. And even on the human uh, level, um, I like a lot to talk, to think about this approach of independency, codependency, and interdependency while the interdependency interdependency is this balanced way of the international uh, or of the in interrelationships between people and i think that blockchain is actually you know reflecting this as well all right and so you said you has a, you have an it background how did it start um yeah um i actually I've been really doing a lot of things this why I'm very young. So I, I, I should make some webinars on the transition from one field to another, uh, because the idea is that always you are getting the knowledge. You're not really leaving one industry, but you're taking it to another one. And uh, so in the past, I uh, used to work as the event manager. I was managing a lot of people and a lot of money. Uh, then I was sick of it and I went to more PR, marketing, um, uh, industry and then I went to IT um, and uh, it was more about uh, it's been three years ago and it was more about the product development actually and um, over the past two years I had a chance to cooperate on various projects uh, also from the cybersecurity perspective um, and more analytical way so i'm not coding um but yeah like I, I every project is partly different i would say that i interconnect uh the marketing mindset uh the product thinking and at the same time the technical uh perspective uh into everything i'm doing actually and so changing from one job to another, one sector to another, uh, was Liberland your first blockchain project or was it something else? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Liberland uh, is my first blockchain cooperation. Uh, while I'm on the representative level of the thing, but at the same time, I have to understand also their approach to decentralization of the government. Um, so yeah, I, it, this is again where, uh, you know, the, the technology is actually interconnecting with the human things like the government and uh, how it can affect the life. All right. And um, what uh, are the projects that, uh, that struck you as, you know, world changing potentially when you arrived in this sector? Because mm. Liberland is highly political, of course, as a project, more political than business oriented. So I assume you have seen many of them. Uh, well, actually, this is this is another aspect of what I love about Liberland. Just if you don't know it, it's an independent country that has been um, man created uh, eight years ago. We will be celebrating the anniversary now in, in April and uh, it stands for freedom. Um, and thanks to the project, because I'm the representative of the country for the past eight months, so I had a chance to meet other uh, like-minded professionals, but not only from the political scene, actually, but also from the business scene, because many business people are actually libertarians for the core of thing, you know, like 
you understand it when you start making money. So uh, you understand where the money flows. And um, this is the surprising thing. So Liberland may be a political thing, a political project, but in fact, it's more thinking the business way on the on the area. And when it comes to uh, the metaverse projects uh, that are related to it, so I had a chance to cooperate with some Georgian companies since I'm I'm not Georgian myself, but I'm the representative uh, to the country because I live there. I moved there because Georgia meets my um, value of freedom as well as liberal and das. So I'm really happy over there. It's a beautiful country with low taxation and uh, very uh, high ease of doing business. And over there, uh, there are many businesses that are currently rising in the past years. And many of them are actually based in uh, metaverse or uh, are from the blockchain industry. And uh, I think the reason for it, because I was, I'm also running my own podcast, uh, Liberland in Georgia, simply. Okay. And over there, I had a chance to talk to some other professionals from the industry. And um, actually, the thing is that in Georgia, people are very, very used to uh, payment with a phone. And so despite it's a very, it's, it's pretty small market because the country has only 3.5 million people in the capital lives around 1.5 million people in Tbilisi. Uh, but many people are just used to pay everything with uh, their phones. And so coming up with a new project uh, that will be uh, from the on the fintech uh, industry, it's very easy. So just a few weeks ago, I saw some new um, uh, crypto card being invented in Georgia. So it's going there in this direction. And I'm really proud to see this around uh, because there are really many startups and many projects over there that are, um, that are related to this. All right. Uh, so uh, I was browsing while you were telling me this and uh, I feel, you know, every time somebody tells me, yeah, I live in this country and the country is not the US or um, a European country that I know well, uh, I feel compelled to ask what is the legal st uh, status of uh, cryptocurrencies in Georgia for, at the moment? So is it, oh. how's the legislation? Mm, thank you so much for asking. This is actually one of the things that make many people to come to the country, actually. Okay. And it is <laughs> that, the, yes, is that uh, Georgia is very, very crypto friendly. And I just had out uh, one of my episodes of the podcast with the chief crypto officer of the major bank in the country of Bank of Georgia. And so they already are now crypto I, I will talk about the legislation shortly but they are already uh crypto friendly and they aim to make it even easier for the businesses uh to to make, make it even more flawless to cooperate with uh companies um especially those that are already like based in blockchain or that are accepting crypto so it's very very it's a very normal thing over there. Even you're walking on the street and you have so many ATMs and you have a uh, local crypto exchange crypto uh, that is it's super flawless. Like you get your money to your account, like if you need to exchange uh, cryptocurrencies into fiat and vice versa, it's a question of seconds. So it's really super easy. And from the legislation perspective, so cryptocurrencies are there taxed at zero percent. So you do not have it have any administration you don't have any text from it um yeah so it's it's uh, from the legislation perspective what is good about it is that already it has some existing legislation so that you cannot expect that the country will come up with um you know some uh changes but uh at the same time the legislation is very nice so uh it it actually attracts many uh, blockchain projects uh, to move to the country, which is what happened, especially over the past year. So uh, one of the major, uh, I think, industry thing over there now, despite it's a very small country, as I already mentioned, is that also um, um, the Binance moved to the country and opened uh, their offices there. We had um, wow. a visit from the CEO from CZ who was also having a dinner with the prime minister. So these are the relations uh, okay. of blockchain with Georgia. So yeah, okay, it's, there it's are obvious reasons to, to go there when you're a crypto enthusiast. Yeah, especially what is really exciting are, of course, like 
it's not only you know some projects but people are moving in and you have so many so many events related to this like of course there are some general startup events and investor meetups but from the block just the blockchain community is getting really really big it's like thousands of people be it locals or expats and uh I, I, even on in winter i was really already tired of going to all those meetups and events because sometimes there were even two uh meetups in a day so um <laughs> you know when it was saturday and there was like cardano meetup it was a beautiful beautiful event and there were actually many people from the government as well who were invited. So Georgia is really innovative and progressive. Uh, but, you know, it was Saturday and someone came to me and they were like, hey, what's your name? What are you doing? And I was already tired because I spent the whole week on the events in the evening. So, yeah, it, Georgia is a blockchain really mm, heaven, I would say, from the perspective of uh, community, despite it's such a small country and uh, progress. And there's not a legislation that would slow it down. So this is very good. Okay, so an active hub, uh, like compared to the comparable to the likes uh, of Miami or uh, Portugal or uh, Denver, these uh, these big cities. Georgia is comparable to that. Yeah. Well, you know the thing is that um, you may have uh, some other places that are popular among people who are based in cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. but then there's uh, there are some legislation options. I know that they have been already changing their legislation uh, related to the taxes over the past years, several okay. times, and it's it's totally not um, from the legislation perspective. It's not a stable environment where I would love to move. So yeah, like G uh, Georgia is uh, much better for this. So it's, it's more, you know, open minded, it's more free. Uh, freedom minded yeah so All right. wonderful <laughs> and uh so because of that uh, this is um bringing and uh, raising another question so at the moment one of the big use cases that is still immature but that will be ubiquitous in the future is that people will probably pay in crypto all around in 10 years because just the, um, the the standard ACH transfer takes three days, and uh, usually it uh, it takes some fees. So for an e-commerce an e-commerce business, for example, a cryptocurrency transfer will cost something like zero point one or zero point three percent of the of the transaction. Oh, sorry, I have a cat coming in on my screen. Uh, but that means that a um, a Stripe payment will, will, would take something between 1.5 and and 3%. Oh, yeah. So, of course, the, the, the profit margin for businesses is bigger. Uh, the payment, uh, the time transfer is, um, transfer time is uh, way lower. So, it's a no-brainer that uh, cryptocurrencies will be used very widely in the future, and also because most governments are preparing uh, preparing a um, their own version of a cryptocurrency, perhaps less free than a uh, uh, than a, a real cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano, and all those that uh, that we know. But still, the use case is there. The question is, uh, in your opinion. What do you think is required for that institution to become more mainstream? To have people using it, like, what would it ha would need to happen mm. in order to see your grandmother paying her French baguette yeah. or something like that in in uh, in a bakery? Something as yeah, simple as that. Yeah, you know, actually, you can see this in Georgia. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, really? Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's even a market that is uh, I don't remember the name honestly, but uh, I know that there's like a chain. Uh, of markets they're accepting uh, litecoins okay and uh, what to do as a product uh, to to make people or to become mainstream is uh, just the ease of use <sighs> yeah people yeah, want to be lazy and, yeah and like the clarification of the process how it works and what is it because i think that there's a lot of um you know it's just too complicated for some people so that they do not understand. And when people do not understand, they do not trust. People have to first trust you to start using your business, to start investing or putting money on your wallet, let's say. But if people do not understand. So I think it's rather the question of education, of awareness. Okay. And uh, 
you know when you want to make something mainstream so um it, it must be just popular sort of like so if major people and i think again like i think this is already happening so i wouldn't say that it's a question of 10 years especially as i mentioned georgia it's it's a really really good example like when i said uh in a georgian bank that people prefer a uh, physical card because they need to withdraw cash because in many places in europe you still need cash so the georgian manager of the bank she was looking at me like what you know, everyone, has, <laughs> everyone has um she was like showing me the phone and i was like yeah i know but they need cash and she's like no, I'm paying with my phone. <laughs> and, you know, she's like 45 years old. And uh, being 45, it's still fun. But uh, I mean, like, literally, you have six years old uh, grannies over there who are going to the shop and who are paying with their phone, with and Apple Pay. Yeah, so so the process, uh, the user experience would be the same if that was a Bitcoin Pay or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah, so it's rather the adaptation, but what I'm actually afraid of when you mention these governmental, the CBDCs, um, the problem about these governmental um, cryptocurrencies, uh, to me, it only to the con to the contrary, it lacks distrust. It is is I, I, I distrust this payment. I do not trust this uh, sort of you know like. It's not something that I would love to invest in. And from what I already saw, the countries where some, there were some African countries where they already implemented it. So almost no one is using it because people do not trust in it. If people do not trust it, so they won't use your service. You have to build trust. And uh, of course, also another problem is that there are some, uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of scam. There are many projects that just failed that were, not really there were some Ponzi scheme whatever and they were now they were not real mm. and um then this caused the whole industry actually to gain this mistrust so what it's it's just I, I think that despite I am not for like you don't need a KYC exchange like Binance I think but at the same time what they are doing very well is that they increase this ease of using the service and uh, they share this awareness. So uh, you can you can have this uh, Binance card uh, again in your Apple wallet and you can just use it everywhere you go. And in on the spot, it exchange your crypto into Euro and you pay with that. So this is a simple example. Despite maybe I'm not a fan of it, but they are doing a very important thing for the whole industry. They're increasing the trust. Uh, they're showing that they're transparent, whatever, and they're increasing this awareness and they start pushing this ease of using the product. Yeah, they're, they're making the products very common in the, uh, in the collective yes. subconscious. Yeah, and it's important to show people that it just won't cause them any harm, that it won't, you know, be complicated. And um, yeah, it, so that it wouldn't be any more just a question for... Uh, a few people who are like uh, technically oriented. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about a few countries that had uh, CBDCs in, in Africa. So I know about China's Chinese yuan, uh, digital yuan, that is um, planned to have an expiration date, which means that people couldn't even uh, spare their money. So that means that they, wow. they, they couldn't yeah. save money. And that means that. Uh, in a in a totalitarian country, perhaps not China. I don't know. Maybe an even uh, no. I mean, a, a totalitarian country. We don't know who it would be. Um, in such a country, that means that people couldn't even save money to leave a country. Uh, they wouldn't even have the means to pay for a, a black market plane ticket or. Um, a seat on a boat uh, going off the grid and trying to, to leave the place. Um, are there CBDCs like that in Africa or is it something different? That Did you see some projects in some countries that were uh, already worrisome to you? Yeah, I, I'm, what I was mentioning, I, I just went through some uh, article quickly so that I, I was interested that like people are not really using it. So that was the whole perspective by which we were mentioning. I, I've read this as well. And it's really, 
it's terrible it's frightening to me but you know i believe i have a very strong belief that the more extreme the regulations and the more extreme the totalitarian perspective the more extreme are also is the answer it's the alternative Ooh, interesting. so while you know look at the word because especially when i talk to some other friends who are again especially in blockchain so uh they're in the they are in the industry for years and they tell me look it's been always like that so always the market just responds with the other extreme so i'm not worried about this my friend Yuri Bednar he wrote a book in english about uh the topic about his prognosis for the next year and he was mentioning there um that to the contrary it will actually enable many businesses to do their way it, it will it's possible that you know people will be just asking for cash and for exchanges that will be non kyc so that there would be no um no control available and it, it's possible that one day we will just have an application in our phone and we will just say oh i want to exchange 200 dollars and someone will come on a scooter in five minutes and will give us cash. Mm. Yeah, and, okay, interesting. Yeah, and now I'm sorry, but like coming to this, let's say, parallel economy or really like capitalistic uh, perspective, I'm now in Vietnam, which is actually a socialistic country, mm. but the economy is obviously super capitalistic. So you have a house and on the ground floor, you just open the shop with a uh, no matter what you want to sell. So people are going around what they could want. Okay, they might want to buy water, they might want to buy a coconut, whatever you sell coconut, you sell water and you sell an iced tea. Okay, people actually want some iced tea because you didn't sell any water for a month. Good. So you start selling just the iced tea. And um, this is this 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 is just like the ease of making business which is the same in georgia and i can see it so just like you want to start selling something you go and you start selling it without no tax you not really register and so on and uh the same you know yesterday i was just observing i was watching one guy who's driving on his bike motorbike with coconuts and when someone just you know waves so he stops and he cuts you the coconut and he gives it to you and he goes away yeah. And when you think about it from the bureaucratic perspective, he totally 100%, I'm sure he doesn't have any registration. He doesn't have any, you don't have any way so that you could say, oh, this is how much money you made. This is how many coconuts you sold. I saw you, whatever. You can't catch him because he's already around the corner selling another coconut. And so I think <laughs> that partly we will just get back to this. Another thing is you don't have, uh, most of the businesses are not on Google Maps. And I think this is what will just return. So it will be more community based. It will be more trust based. It will be, hey, where can I get my laundry done? And people, uh, well, because when I was Googling, it was just two kilometers away from me. No, the owner of the hotel tells you, yeah, just go to the right and there's a lady and uh, you just knock the door and she will make your laundry. And this is what I did. It sounds very different to what we know, but this is the difference between community and trust based mindset and the government and market based by mindset. And so, you, you know, th this reminds me of an anecdote. Um, so, as you know, I am French. We have discussed this uh, just before. Sorry for the the accent is coming back every time I'm talking about about my homeland. Sebia. Sebia. <laughs> uh, the thing is, uh, French uh, Fr France has a huge culture of um, of food. I mean, it's a bit cliche, but many French people I know are really fo uh, are hardcore foodies more more than in many other countries, and for some reason. In most places in France, we do not have street food. We have very little street food, so few shops compared to how many delicious dishes we have. So part of this can be explained with the culture of excellence and saying, no, you make le boeuf bourguignon in three hours, so you don't just do that in, in a minute, uh, you know, um, with just uh, two pieces of wood and, uh, and a plank making a table. But my theory about that is that the places in which you see the biggest amounts of street food are the places where the bureaucracy is is not harsh because 
if you have a small business and you basically need two months to start your business to be allowed to have a little street food stand or something like that, this is going to be very hard for you to, to start selling that. And in France, there's a very low tolerance for that. If you want to sell waffles or uh, lemonade or what, whatever you want, mm. e even a food truck, even if you're not harming anybody, even if you're not blocking any kind of, um, of road traffic, you're still going to have a lot of, um, of bureaucracy to go through just to do that. I know because I had a waffle, um, a waffle stand in, uh, on the street uh, a long time ago. And um, on the opposite, Singapore is very different. In Singapore, you can just you know, put that in, and do your declaration in a minute. And that's... That's why Singapore has very rich places w filled with street food stands, despite the little, the, the small size of the country. So yeah. that's quite interesting. Um, you know, wh when you're mentioning this, I think that it comes hand in hand. So when you talk about the seriousness of the food and food culture, let's say. Yeah. So bureaucracy is the same principle. It's about let's play how serious we are. Let's make us look better. Let's make it more complicated because when it's more complicated, so it seems that it brings any some extra value. But in fact, that's not true. Yeah, it's still an extra value. But but France has that, for example, with degrees. Uh, if you want to teach um, a security guard the processes, the state will make it mandatory to also teach uh, history and geography and uh, and mathematics. So the guy who just wanted to have a job and to be ready soon and who's fit for the job of a security guard will have to, to pass an exam and could be denied the the certification because he didn't pass the um, the the geography exam at the end so yeah that, that's that's a bit sta sad and so uh, I have a question here for you in your opinion what um, what would be the differences in in adoption between a B two B and B two C um, because here you were talking about many use cases in the B two C world which I love because. It's great to see that it's becoming mainstream, but do you think that uh, regulations and payments and for mid-sized business, uh, um, not the guy who sells coconuts, uh, this guy probably can use his his own QR code and receive payments. Many countries came back to to cash again, like Austria and Sweden. So. I'm not talking about small-sized businesses, but mid-sized businesses, those that do not move huge truckloads of money, but uh, still, they move a bit more money and they have more fees than just, you know, a little motorbike and uh, and a yeah. stash of coconuts. For these mid-sized businesses, what do you think the um, the amount of regulations would, uh, would be in the future? Do you think that the trend would be the same, going um, offering on the market something with no KYC as well? You know, uh, well, when it comes to B2C, so... In the end, it's it's just a question of scalability. Mm -hmm. When you scale a business to be bigger, so it it, it doesn't have to be. Um, it's difficult to say, like how to avoid how to avoid the uh, the the controls and how to avoid um, this surveillance. It's it's difficult indeed. Like what I can think of is just more again decentralization of the business on multiple branches and going for anonymous way like you can have some uh, let's say de delivery boxes or you can have what is because we are doing... <laughs> it's fine because we are doing to uh, much more you know delivery oriented industries and so delivery is really rising so I can imagine that even for a bigger business, you can just have some app via which you or website or whatever, where you order what you want and they deliver it to you. Cheers. Mm. So this can be done. And on the, on the perspective of B2B, um, which you, because I think that's an interesting idea. So you just apply the same, like, um, really it's, it's the saying that we, uh, we used to, uh, have trust to the community. And when you think in the community, you think more, uh, when you trust the community, you think more long term, mm -hmm. because you know that if you fail uh, the community, so you are responsible and no one will talk to you, no one will give you work, no one will 
trust you anymore and so on. But if you fail under the current system, which is based, it's much more run on the trust to the government and trust to the to the market. So if you fail, you have so many regulations and so many laws that you do not really have the skin in the game. You do not really have the responsibility anymore. So I don't know, You let's say you did some scam to many people and but because of the law so you just close the company and you're fine you do not really have any responsibility and so when i sorry i, I will just get back to how the b2b businesses well, can what, what you're selling is saying is totally in topic i mean th this is also a um, trust is a core topic so this is not off topic at all yeah and so when it comes to the b2b on a what potentially could be the future when it comes to some, let's say, parallel society thinking. So you just will return again to the community way of thinking. So you will, which is much better because you will try, you will start to um, think really, you know, you really want to deliver a good service to another company because if you don't, you won't be accepted in within the, the way of society and within the, um, community and i wouldn't say that it's it's even working nowadays it's exactly this when you say uh, you know whom to ask uh, to i don't know to make your repairment of the of the flat or of the office so you are asking your friends for recommendations and this is exactly it so you just create this chain of recommendations and you are more motivated into delivering a good service because if you deliver a good service so other people will recommend you further yeah yeah, so that's a paradox, but that's very understandable. That means that if you centralize power a bit more to offer um, accountability, there there's going to be less accountability in the end, right? Yeah, well said. <laughs> of course. All right, so th that's really interesting because uh, that means that we could have basically two markets coexisting in your opinion in the future just like there could be an uh, an internet which is truly decentralized and an internet where there is a lot of algorithmic governance and um, neuromarketing where the people are basically selling you s things before you need before you know that you would like to buy them and there would be those two internets coexisting there uh, would there be those two types of economy uh, economics coexisting at the same time yeah, this is an interesting perspective or question because the problem of the internet is that like the physical cables, you cannot just really get new physical cables and they are again uh, regulated. Um, uh, so uh, the, com the country can say that they won't let your content through. Yeah. They can just block uh, your content on the particular uh, territory. So this is a question because yeah um you know the the idea of the internet was exactly this to to create this uh, another word and the the government is understanding that people are getting into their own parallel society already and they cannot control it so they try to control it but this will only lead to a harsh censorship of course which is already in in making sadly according to uh, the legislation that is being uh, in process around the world in different countries, sadly. So, um, well, it's it sounds like, you know, 1984 kind of, actually. So, um, I, at one of my presentations, I was asking people whether we still have the power over the government. So, would you are, because what you're saying, yes, of course, like there can be another parallel society in the future. I don't think it would be some second internet because it's very difficult from the logistic perspective. It's very, it's very pricey to just, you know, have satellites. Get there. Yeah. Uh, it, it, just to make this happen. Um, and again, like they, they won't just let you to make this, uh, I'm afraid, but, um, uh, I think that there might be more like community based, uh, recommendation based uh, societies uh, somewhere in parallel. But at the same time, is this where we really want to get it to? Mm. You know, like, do we really have to get to the point where we will have to hide ourselves and uh, be hiding our cash? And, uh, you know, it, it sounds ridiculous. Like, because um, there's a, a 
one point that people are often missing and it is that you know government is not uh it's not your <laughs> is that how it people are thinking about it so that you are the slave of the government so that you have to be compliant with them but actually you are paying these people so the paradox is that you are paying someone to enslave you <laughs> yeah this is what we are doing okay. and we are saying oh a new legislation or censorship that's not good we don't like this so if you're asking me what do i think in the future so that we will have let's say a, nor a regular and parallel society or not or how it will look like so i hope my high hopes go so that we will never really have to even discuss this we will never have to create a parallel society from the regular i hope that the that the norm will not be us to be compliant with cbdc to have some social score to have you know it sounds uh all these ak fake news or whatever uh I, i'm 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 not reading any news honestly myself because i studied media which only made me ensure that i don't want to work in them but um, <laughs> this is how it, how is it but um what, what used to be a misinformation is really a legislation that is in process which is really frightening to me and but i don't want to and I, i'm just reading those legislations which uh are real and it's really happening there are some really stupid things that are coming and so i hope that it will never go to such a harsh time so that we will have to create some such a harsh uh, alternative but sadly the current you know journey where the world is going it's really frightening so i hope that at some point this will get reversed or not reversed, but rather it will just jump to a more pro freedom way. And this is just let to, to keep it in a frame. So where we started was uh, my participation at Liberland. And to me, Liberland is one of the countries that are actually, or one of the, let's say pro freedom projects who are trying to show the world that things could be done differently. They could be done for, um, the the goodwill of uh, people that that uh, the go the government that the country could be done for freedom and this is this is important to me so every such a pro freedom project is important to me and it's important to uh, support yeah that's wonderful and you know that was exactly where I wanted to close the interview because usually at the end I ask. Um, about the threats and the, the potential uh, challenges the, um, the sector will have to overcome. And you, in your own words, uh, already responded to that question. So thank you so much. Any last word or any last topic you want to add? Thank you so much. Uh, just um, if you liked uh, the interview, if you like my thoughts, so I'm more focused on the, on the topic of the individual freedom. Uh, I will be running more educational content on this uh, how practically we can uh, regain more opportunities in the world, uh, in our life, and of course also in at work. And yeah, like uh, I'll be happy to stay in touch with every uh, open-minded and like-minded person. So feel free to text me. Thank you so much, Gautier, for inviting me today. Thank you, everyone. You were listening to Mutual Knowledge. The guest was Sam Davidova. Have a look at her work. Links in the description. Of course, you can like, share, and subscribe to Mutual Knowledge for more content about the blockchain industry for professionals and individual entrepreneurs. Bye, everyone. Thank you.